Greetings, viewer. Don't forget to visit my website for links to support the production of these works if you value what I'm doing. I appreciate any help you can offer. Thank you for having a look and a listen. Yours, John Loth. The Evolution of Civilization by Carol Quigley Read by John Loth Chapter 7 Mesopotamian Civilization The degree to which civilizations conform to the seven-stage pattern and the distortions made in these stages by the matrix in which each civilization is embedded can be seen by examining the historical evolution of various civilizations. In this chapter we shall try to do this for the first civilization that ever existed, the one founded by the Sumerians in the valley of the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. We have pointed out that the peasants of the Neolithic garden cultures practiced shifting cultivation, tilling the soil in an area for seven or eight years until the fertility of their fields was reduced sufficiently to curtail their crop yields and make it advantageous to abandon their huts and move on a short distance to more productive fields. In general, these peasant peoples followed the hilly edges of the highland zone, avoiding heavily forested areas or the steeper slopes and clinging rather to the lower valleys, parklands, or lowest lands. Although they could cut down forest trees, it was easier to use more open areas. Above all, it was necessary to settle near water, either from springs or from local streams. Eventually, some of these peoples came into the alluvial river valleys, including that of the Tigris-Euphrates system. Here, conditions were quite different from what they were on the flanks of the hills above these streams. The annual flood, whose sediment replaced the nutritive elements taken from the soil by cropping, made possible, for the first time, permanent settlements, and thus the foundation of city life and civilized living. But the same flood that made the valley fertile made living in it dangerous and precarious. It takes an imaginative effort on our part to picture the minds of these early peasants who were ignorant of what we take to be self-evident. They had no calendars or other methods for keeping track of time. In fact, they hardly recognized the existence of time as we know it. They knew nothing of the year or the movement of the earth that determined it. They had no knowledge of the causes of the flood, and at the beginning may not even have recognized that it was periodic. Above all, they could not have imagined any connection between the movements of the sun and the arrival of the flood. Undoubtedly, as can be seen in the archaeological evidence, the flood struck unexpectedly and brought destruction, death, and fear, along with its fertilizing sediment. At Ur, in the lower valley, Sir Leonard Woolley found evidence of human residence both below and above a layer of flood-deposited clay, from eight to fourteen feet thick, laid down by a great prehistoric inundation which had covered about 40,000 square miles of valley. Sir Leonard believed that this might have been the deluge of the Bible, about 3600 BC, but this view has not been generally accepted. There is no need to accept it, for similar, if perhaps less devastating floods, must have been a frequent occurrence in these valleys. We have no knowledge of how the early peasant residents of Mesopotamia dealt with this problem, or with another similar one. The excess of water in the valley at one season was balanced by a deficiency of water during much of the growing season, so that irrigation was almost as urgent as flood control. For projects such as these, the early peasant peoples lacked both knowledge and capital. No individuals, families, or small groups of families could find the economic surplus or the social organization that would permit them to construct such projects. Undoubtedly, for a long time, the peasant inhabitants of the valley must have lived a precarious life, perhaps keeping their homes on the higher sites that were less frequently flooded, while their fields were down in the floodplain itself. 
But eventually, possibly before 5000 BC, a social organization capable of accumulating an economic surplus and able to direct its application to productive projects came into existence. The nature of this organization in the prehistoric period must be inferred from the evidence available about such an organization in the earliest historic period. At that later time, about 3000 BC, in each city-state of Mesopotamia, the accumulation of economic surplus was in the hands of a distinctive social group, the Sumerian priesthood. It arose from their control in the name of the gods they served, of a considerable part of the land and of the community, and of tributes levied, usually in kind, upon the produce of lands owned by others. The chief tasks of the priesthoods, at the later date, beyond their obvious religious functions, were the study of the stars and the keeping of the records of celestial observations. From this evidence, we might infer that, at some remote date, some unsung genius, or better, some observant family, saw a connection between the advent of the flood and the movements of the sun, two events that had not previously seemed connected. This individual or family noted that the rising sun appeared at a slightly different point on the horizon each morning, finally reaching a limit where it hesitated for a few days before it began to return. We would say that the position at which the sun rose moves 47 degrees of the full circle of the horizon, over a period of some 180 days or more. Thus was born a rudimentary idea of the solar year the full duration of the sun's movement back to its starting point. In time, these observers noticed that the flood always came about the same number of days after the sun reached its most southern rising point. With this information, the observer was able to estimate roughly the day on which the flood would arrive each year. This calculation the discoverers kept secret, for their own profit using the knowledge to work on the fears and superstitions of their neighbors, trying to convince others that they possessed magical powers, enabling them to foretell the arrival of the flood, or even the power to make it arrive. The original discoverers of this information could hardly have told the arrival of the flood within a span of time much less than ten days. However, the fear engendered by the flood was so great increased by the realization that the crops would fail if it did not arrive, that some, at least, accepted the discoverers' claims and yielded to their demands for tribute. The discoverers probably offered to reveal the time of the flood in advance to those who would contribute a share of their crops, or perhaps they even threatened to bring the flood or to keep it away if they failed to obtain promises of tithes from the crops of their neighbors. However skeptical these neighbors might be of such claims the first year, no more than one lucky forecast was needed for most of them to become willing givers. After all, in such an important matter, it is safer to be on the right side. The ignorance of the majority made it easy for the possessors of this specialized knowledge to use it as proof that they had supernatural powers. Moreover, it was not necessary to convince a majority or even many of the neighbors. If any small number contributed, a surplus would accumulate, which could be used in the form of flood protection embankments or irrigation ditches to provide very concrete evidence that it was worthwhile to belong to the new organization. Thus came into existence the central institution of ancient Mesopotamia, the Sumerian priesthood. This priesthood became a closed group, able to control enormous wealth and incomes, and concerned very largely with the study of the solar and astronomical periodicities on which their influence was originally based. With the surplus thus created, the priesthood was able to command human labor in large amounts and to direct this labor from the simple tillage of the peasant peoples to the diversified and specialized activities that constitute civilized living. Above all, this centralized direction provided the system of flood control and irrigation on which all subsequent progress was founded. Similarly, these priest-controlled surpluses 
provided the capital for the many inventions of the age of expansion of Mesopotamian civilization. 1. Mixture Mesopotamian civilization began with a period of mixture, although this occurred at such an early date that we must, once again, work from inference. We have already mentioned the fact that the sexagesimal number system of Mesopotamia in the historic period must have arisen from a fusion of a decimal system and a duodecimal system, and possibly of a third element based on twenty. The widespread evidence for the very early duodecimal system, especially in the diffusion of the practice of dividing into twelve parts the wide band of fixed stars through which the sun passes in its annual revolution, the zodiac, and the association of this feature with painted pottery gardening, would indicate that the duodecimal system was a characteristic of the highland-zoned Neolithic peasant cultures. The decimal usage probably came from the Semite peoples within the Fertile Crescent. If a vigesimal system also entered into the mixture, it might have come from the south or southeast, for there seem to be, in the substrata of Mesopotamian culture, elements of tropical forest origin from this direction. Of course, these tropical forest elements, including the use of the dugout canoe and of certain vegetally reproduced plants, especially the date palm, may have come into Mesopotamia somewhat earlier with the diffusion of those forest-dwelling traits that went to make up the European Mesolithic cultures. The chief reason for attributing these elements to the period of mixture of Mesopotamian civilization is the very powerful one that no archaeological evidence for these elements, or for any human habitation of the lower valley earlier than the Neolithic garden occupation of the upper valley, has been found. Yet the fact that Mesopotamia received tropical livestock, like fowl and swine, about the same time that it received the highland zone herd animals, as well as the fact that neither came from the Semites, makes it necessary to postulate a third element of northern origin in the Mesopotamian mixture. This element may have come by way of the mysterious civilization recently discovered by Danish archaeologists on Bahrain Island. Additional evidence for early cultural mixture can be found in the confusion that existed in the early historic period between solar and lunar deities. Sometimes the sun was regarded as a male god, less frequently as a female goddess. It was usually symbolized by a disk or many-pointed sunburst star. Usually the moon was regarded as a female deity, but occasionally it was considered to be male. The usual moon symbol was a crescent, but sometimes it seems to have been symbolized as a complete circle, thus leading to confusion with the solar disk. This ambivalence of ideas on these two heavenly bodies seems to have arisen from a mixture of ideas from Neolithic peasant and from pastoral Semite sources. It seems evident that early hunting people were patriarchal, regarded the male as more important than the female, and similarly considered the moon as more significant than the sun. The changes of the moon were more easily observed than any changes in the sun's position would be to hunting people, especially at lower latitudes, and the use of the moon rather than the sun for hunting or fishing made it a much more significant object in their lives. Accordingly, almost all early hunting people told time by the moon, and many of them considered it to be a male, if not a deity. The sun would obviously be the moon's consort, and thus female. When people passed from a hunting existence to pastoralism, without any intervening stage of peasant agriculture, as the Semites did, these ideas were retained, since moon changes were very significant to livestock tenders. It is therefore not surprising that the early Semite pastoralists knew the moon as a male deity, sometimes called Sin and knew the sun as a goddess, frequently called Shapash. These ideas, like the Semites themselves, came into Mesopotamia. The Highland Garden peoples, as we have indicated, had quite different ideas 
since they regarded the female as more important than the male in economic and social life, and had as their chief deity the earth mother goddess. The sun, which was of secondary importance to the earth, was male, if it was regarded as a deity at all. When the Neolithic peasant peoples developed civilizations in the alluvial river valleys, males became more significant in their social, economic, and political life, and the sun became much more significant in their economic activities. In religion, this served to reduce the earth goddess to a secondary role and make a male solar deity of primary significance. But this whole development was much confused by the persistent intrusion of Semite religious ideas in which the moon was male and of more importance. The rather chaotic ideas on these matters to be found in Mesopotamia in the historic period were thus a consequence of cultural mixtures and not a reflection of incapacity to think clearly. 2. Gestation Since the stage of gestation is, by definition, a period in which nothing sensational happens, it is not an easy period to discern in the prehistoric evidence. If we assume that the first agriculturalists came into Mesopotamia about 6000 BC, we might postulate a period of mixture for about a thousand years, and a period of gestation about half as long. In this period a new way of life different from the Neolithic garden culture existed. Sedentary existence for centuries in one area would have reduced game and made hunting of little importance. On the other hand, especially in the more humid southern valley, where there was abundance of grass and reeds, the care of domestic animals would have increased in importance. As long as hoe culture continued as the normal method of tillage, this probably remained a largely feminine occupation. Thus the Neolithic society, where women generally tilled the soil and men hunted or did little, was superseded by a new culture, where men became active contributors to economic life, caring for domestic animals. As a consequence, dairying became of great significance, eventually with powerful religious overtones, and the social superiority of women was reduced. This rise in the position of men was increased by the appearance of the Sumerian priesthood, which must have been a predominantly masculine organization, since idly looking at the heavenly bodies or speculating on the relationships between their movements and earthly events is not something busy females would be likely to do. It would be much more likely to be found among watchers of herds than among those whose eyes are directed downward in daylight hoeing of the soil. The growth in importance of animal care may also have resulted in clearer recognition of the male role in reproduction. Where the Neolithic culture had regarded women as productive both of crops and of children, the new Mesopotamian culture came to recognize the male role in production of both. This, in time, led to a shift in religious emphasis from fertility to virility. The symbol of the former had been the Earth Mother, represented by a female figurine, or simple torso of clay, usually shown as pregnant and always shown as excessively female. The symbol of virility now came to be symbolized by the bull. This does not mean that the older ideas of fertility and the earth mother were abandoned, but that they were supplemented and to some extent eclipsed by newer ideas. The earth mother was given a son, who was also her lover, a heavenly bull, who was associated with the periodicity of the year and thus with the sun. As the sun came and went, and the crops died and were reborn, so this new male god of growing things and of life's vigor died and was reborn annually. His mother, like all women, was associated with the moon in a monthly cycle. In time, the symbol of the dying god became the sun's disk, while that of the earth mother became the moon, either as circle or as crescent. These two gave rise to a large number of paired symbols, 
that together stood for the productiveness of natural processes of birth and decay. The sun bull became equivalent to the high-flying eagle or falcon, while the earth cow became equivalent to the crescent ship or to the earth's intimate, the snake. The life-giving subterranean waters of the earth mother were given symbolic fertility by representing the dying god as a fish in these waters. Or, by a similar juxtaposition, the swelling mound of earth that stood for the productive female principle was made fertile by inserting in it a rod or a pole, a pillar or a tree. In Egypt, where the mound of earth became a pyramid, the pillar became an obelisk. The public triangle, sharply marked on the torso figurines of the Earth Mother, was made into a more powerful symbol of productive force by attaching to the triangle a rod representing the male principle. This combination of triangle and rod came to be regarded as an axe symbol, one of the most pervasive archaic representations of natural productiveness and power. These new religious ideas, in their generalized forms, were widely diffused. They included the belief that death was an essential preliminary to resurrection, both for men and for crops, and the idea that reproduction of children through sex and of crops from planting were but two aspects of the fruitful relationship of two pervasive principles of fertility and virility. The deities associated with these ideas are known in general terms as the Earth Mother Goddess and the Dying God. Babylonian Ishtar had a consort, Tammuz. Egyptian Isis had Osiris. Syrian Astarte had her son, Adon. Anatolian Sibylle had a son, Attis. The Cretan Ray had a son, Zeus who became confused in character and name with the pastoral sky god of the northern flatlands. In Greece and Rome, where Indo-European ideas were powerful, there was considerable confusion of these ideas. The sexual aspect became separated from the vegetation aspect, one being associated with Aphrodite, or Venus, and her lover, Adonis while the other was associated with Demeter, or Ceres. In Greece, the original oriental legend of the dying god became the familiar story of Demeter and her daughter, Persephone, whose annual visit to Hades caused the death of vegetation in the summer season. Changes such as these are not easy to document from the archaeological record since they are not material, but they clearly must be inferred to explain the evidence of the later period, when the invention of writing makes it possible to obtain clearer records of ideological developments. These changes, which we can postulate for the ages of mixture and gestation, were greatly influenced by the development of the Sumerian priesthood. It is extremely likely that the importance of this priesthood was organizational rather than religious or ideological at first. By 4500, this organizational significance was fully established. A new separate group had emerged in Mesopotamian society, and this group was accumulating control of wealth beyond its own immediate consumption needs, and using this surplus to command the resources of production into capital projects. It is not clear to us how this development took place, nor why it occurred at numerous different sites in Mesopotamia but the consequences of it are quite evident. Society was launched into an age of expansion. 3. Expansion The age of expansion of Mesopotamian civilization lasted about 2,000 years, say from just before 4500 to just before 2500. In this period, some of the most significant advances in human history were either made or adapted to large-scale use. These include the plow, wheeled carts, and draft animals, bricks, the arch, city life, industrialized manufacture of pottery on the potter's wheel, 
copper, and bronze smelting, a great extension of distant trade, sailboats, writing, an elaborate number system, including positional notation, remarkable advances in astronomy, and to a lesser extent in medicine, and fundamental changes in religious and social life. It is not certain that the plow is a Sumerian invention, although it was clearly used in the prehistoric period before 3000 BC. It may have been invented by the painted pottery peoples, since large stones, which might have been plowshares, but are more likely to be carpentry tools, have been found in their sites in Europe before 2000 BC. But this is a thousand years after the plow was used in Mesopotamia or in Egypt. The early plows of the alluvial valleys were shaped to dig into the soil to break up the sun-baked flood crust rather than to turn over sod. They were simply enlarged and reinforced Neolithic grubbing hose drawn by draft animals. The use of animals, usually oxen, was one of the factors that transformed agriculture from a female to a male activity, since control of oxen was no easy task. From the economic point of view, the significant result of this change was a considerable increase in production, since a much larger area of more fertile ground could be prepared for planting by a plow than by a Neolithic hoe. The wheel is almost certainly a Mesopotamian invention, being found there before 4000 BC, more than 2000 years before it was known in Egypt. It was, of course, better adapted to the broad flat alluvial plain of Mesopotamia than it was to the narrow rocky land of Egypt, especially as the latter's transport needs were much more adequately served by river traffic and draft animals were more conveniently available to the valley of the two rivers. It is more usually assumed that the earliest wheels must have been solid rather than spoked and were simply cross sections of tree trunks previously used as rollers. This is weakened by the fact that large tree trunks were very scarce in Mesopotamia and the earliest representations we have of wheels are spoked. The first of these representations is from level 6 at Hasuna, about 4000 BC, and shows a spoked wheel on a piece of pottery. It seems very likely that this was intended to be a symbol of the sun rather than a wheel, and that the idea of a wheel arose from recognition that sun disks, either solid or rayed, that is, spoked, would roll. From a very early period, Symbols of the gods were displayed as emblems on the walls of temples, or were exposed before the temples, or carried in processions mounted on standards. One of the most common of these emblems was the rayed sun disk. Once it was recognized that such disks would roll, it is very likely that they were first used as wheels on ceremonial carts kept in the temple, as the juggernaut car was in India. In fact, the juggernaut procession, as a necessary ceremony for agrarian fertility, ensured by soaking the earth with blood under the wheels of a solar car, is closely related to some of the earliest religious ideas of Mesopotamia. Once the wheeled cart was invented as a religious ceremonial object, its utilitarian use soon became established, probably to carry tribute to the gods' storehouses. In a short time, it was being used as a war vehicle drawn by more speedy asses or onegas. By 2500 BC, priestly tombs at Ur contained four-wheeled ox-drawn carts of advanced design. The surplus controlled by the priesthood had to be stored, and the priests themselves needed residences and administrative centers for their many activities. In Mesopotamia, which lacked both stone and wood, a solution to this problem was found in the invention of sun-dried bricks about 5000 BC. From this came the invention of the arch, the construction of temple platforms, or ziggurats, and eventually the creation of the debris mound.
or tells, found throughout southwestern Asia. The arch is a very difficult invention, made only once in human history, and accordingly unknown to the Incas or Aztecs. Used in Mesopotamia by the fourth millennium, the arch was probably invented in the form of the dome, of which it is a cross-section. Early Sumerian huts were circular in ground plan, constructed of rushes and wicker wands stuck upright in the earth and tied together at their upper ends. It would soon be noticed that this structure would enclose a wider, more spherical space if a heavy weight were suspended from the center of the roof where the wickers came together. In this way, the whole shape became less of a cone and more of a dome. If an effort were made to face this structure with brick, it would soon appear that the weight hanging from the upper center was an essential feature of the structure and must be retained in the form of a keystone. The arch itself could easily develop from efforts to make a more elongated building from this dome-like structure, just as happened with Eskimo igloos. The arch, which did not diffuse to Egypt until very late, diffused across Syria and Anatolia, and was carried from northwestern Anatolia to northwestern Italy by the Etruscans after 1000 BC. Adopted by the Romans, it was spread by them throughout Western Europe and back to the Near East to Greece and Egypt, becoming the chief feature of ecclesiastical architecture in the medieval period, both in Western cathedrals and in Byzantine churches. An alternative method for roofing large spaces by supporting a lintel across the tops of columns is so simple that it has been invented independently by every child who has played with blocks in his nursery. This was the method that was used regularly by the Egyptians, Minoans, Greeks, and the civilized peoples of America. In this structure, the distance between columns is determined by the breaking point of the lintel under stress from its own weight. This point was so low with the materials available to ancient man that any room of normal width had to be supported by rows of columns down the middle. The temples and priestly palaces of the Mesopotamians were built on the summits of flat-topped stepped pyramids on mounds made of mud or clay and faced with sun-dried or oven-baked bricks, or by pottery jars. These ziggurats, as they were called, are taken as evidence for the highland origin of the Sumerians, since they evidently believed that their gods would feel at home on a high spot, and the word ziggurat meant peak in their language. The earliest temple, found at Tepe Guara, in northern Iraq, goes back to about 4500 BC, on a site that was occupied 700 years later by an elaborate ziggurat surmounted by three large temples. Later, more impressive ziggurats were built at other places, notably further down the valley at Uruk, Ur, and Babylon. The one at Uruk, built about 3200 BC, was oriented to the four points of the compass and measured 140 by 150 feet and was 30 feet high. It supported the oldest stone construction in the valley and a temple measuring 50 by 65 feet. The most famous of these structures was the biblical Tower of Babel, built at Babylon about 2000 BC and rebuilt by Nebuchadnezzar about 600 BC. At a very early date, long before 4000 BC, metal began to be used in the form of natural nuggets of gold and copper. These materials were so valuable and so soft that they could not be used for tools, which continued to be, as previously, of stone. Ornaments, however, were made by hammering and later, probably after the discovery of smelting from ores, by casting. Soon, weapons, probably ceremonial, were made of copper. Eventually, possibly, by natural contamination, it was found that the addition of a small percentage of tin or other metal to copper lowered the melting point and gave a much stronger alloy. 
By 3000 BC, the correct proportions of tin and copper, one to tin, to give strong bronze had been found. As a result, the use of bronze for weapons or tools spread rapidly, and the use of stone decreased. The metallurgical discoveries we have mentioned were not made in Mesopotamia or in any other alluvial valley, since these lacked the necessary raw materials. They were rather products of the highland zone, probably on its southern fringe and fairly close to Lake Van. But the rapidly rising standards of living in the river valleys created a demand able to suck ores and metal products from great distances into the civilized areas. Thus there arose lines of distant trade converging on the Mesopotamian cities. The chief of these lines probably went northward toward Afghanistan, Iraq, Armenia, and the Caucasus, but these lines have not been explored in any adequate fashion by archaeologists. Other better known routes, which are of greater significance to our story, went westward across the Syrian saddle toward Anatolia and the seaports of the Levant. The demand for metals from remote areas was supported by the surpluses accumulated in priestly hands in Mesopotamia. As a result of such demand, small quantities of metal had a great value in terms of agricultural produce, and it was worthwhile to carry metallic products great distances. By 2000 BC, as we have indicated, intermediaries, who were originally Semites but were later more mixed in origin, were bringing Spanish copper, Irish gold, Cornish tin, Bohemian copper, as well as Danish amber to both Mesopotamia and Egypt. Such distant trade would not have been possible without sailing vessels that were developed somewhere in the Near East, probably on the Persian Gulf, before 3000 BC. The introduction of writing and of a system of numbers was undoubtedly made in Mesopotamia as a consequence of their highly developed sense of private property. Seals with incised designs were being used to indicate ownership by impression on clay labels in the fifth millennium. The agglutinative character of the Sumerian language probably assisted the growth of writing, since symbolic marks could readily come to stand for syllables, and its full development was undoubtedly aided by the needs of large-scale priestly administration of temple wealth. Since tribute was contributed to the god in hope of a favorable flood and good crops, and payment was made for water from the god's irrigation channels, records had to be kept. Long before 3000 BC, this was being done by scratching on pieces of clay marsh reeds. Soon this was done by stamp seals, and later still by cylinder seals that could inscribe a continuous record of ownership by being rolled across wet clay. Slowly, an arbitrary system of symbols came to stand for numbers, amounts, and commodities. Later, other symbols came to stand for ideas, and thus for syllables. Such ideographic or syllabic writings were not completely satisfactory, because ideas and syllables are so numerous that a large number of distinct syllables was needed to express even quite simple messages. None of the River Valley civilizations ever made the next step to a system of writing in which a small number of symbols represented the relatively few basic sounds used in any language. The Egyptians came close to this achievement because they did have 24 symbols that stood for monosyllabic words consisting of a consonant and a vowel, and were used to represent the consonant alone. But the Egyptians continued to use hundreds of other symbols for ideas, syllables, or words, and thus never acquired the true alphabet. This great achievement, as we shall see, was made by the Canaanite civilization in the course of the second millennium BC. The number system of Mesopotamian civilization, fully worked out by 2000 BC, was much more efficient than their method of writing. At first they used a system based on tin, but by the historic period they had added one based on 60 for scientific work. 
this was much more convenient to use because it eliminated most fractions. The base 10 is divisible only by itself and 1, 2, and 5. The base 60 is divisible by itself and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10, 15, 20, and 30. Fractions were difficult for these archaic peoples because they could not conceive of fractions except with numerators of one. Thus, three-fourths was written as one-half plus one-fourth. A great advance was made about 2100 BC when the Babylonians adopted positional notation such as we use. In our decimal system, each place from right to left represents a higher power of ten, the figure in each column indicating how many times the power of ten is to be taken. For example, the number 256 represents the sum of 2 times 10 to the second power, 5 times 10 to the first power, and 6 times 10 to the zero power. In the Babylonian system, where each column represents similar powers of 60, the symbol 256 would refer to the sum of 2 times 60 to the second power, 5 times 60 to the first power, and 6 times 60 to the zero power, or 7506 in our decimal system. Positional notation for numbers, even without a symbol for zero, which the Sumerians lacked, is one of the fundamental inventions on which our Western civilization is based. Strangely enough, it was not known to classical antiquity, which used the cumbersome method familiar to us in Roman numerals. With this system, calculations directly with numbers were not possible and had to be performed by some kind of calculating machine, such as pebbles in boxes, or by the use of the abacus. As a result of studies based on religious motives, great progress was made in the field of astronomy. Originally, this interest came from the Sumerian priesthood's concern with the seasons, the solar year, and the date of the flood. It undoubtedly continued because of tradition, from a superstitious interest in astrology, and from the hope that knowledge of astral behavior would help the priests in controlling the credulous masses of the population. At no time was the Mesopotamian approach to astronomy scientific in our sense, and it became less so as time went on. Rather, it was empirical. In our scientific approach, we have an idealized picture of the interrelations of the heavenly bodies, and we try to forecast astronomical events by projecting the relationships of the heavenly bodies into the future from our knowledge of their present positions and future motions. The Mesopotamians made no use of such a picture. Instead, they kept accurate records over long periods of the occurrence of certain events and tried to forecast future occurrences by adding the average period between all past observances of the event to the date of the last observation of it. Since each observation gave them one more period to use in calculating the average period, their estimates became increasingly accurate right to the end of Mesopotamian civilization. This increasing accuracy, for example in foretelling eclipses, must not be taken to indicate a continued advance of science since the whole system was empirical rather than scientific. But the results are impressive. The work of the late Chaldean astronomers, such as Naburimani, alive in 490 BC, or Kidinu, alive in 379, is almost unbelievable. Naburimani gave lists of eclipses of the sun, including ones he knew would not be visible in Babylon. He gave the times on which these eclipses would begin, with errors of only a few minutes. He gave the positions of the planets far into the future with similar small errors. His successor, Kidinu, gave the length of the sidereal year as 365 days, 6 hours, 13 minutes, 43.4 seconds, which is only 4 minutes, 32.65 seconds too long. He gave the length of the Earth's movement from its closest distance to the Sun, away and back again, 
as 365 days, 6 hours, 25 minutes, 46 seconds, the still accepted figure. He gave many other calculations with an accuracy that was not exceeded until the 19th century or is still accepted today. In spite of such observations, Mesopotamia never achieved a 365-day calendar as accurate as the Egyptian. All the alluvial civilizations were troubled by efforts to combine the old Paleolithic month based on changes of the moon with the new agrarian year based on movements of the sun. Since the phases of the moon take about 29 and a half days, while the shifts of the sun take approximately 365 and one-fourth days, it is not possible to fit a round number of lunar months into a solar year. Originally, both civilizations did this by making the year 360 days, or 12 lunar months, of 30 days each. In such a system, both the year and the month were incorrect. The Egyptians remedied the error in the length of the year by adding five days which belonged to no month. The Mesopotamians tried to remedy the error in the length of the month by alternating months of 29 and 30 days. This difference arose because the Egyptian economy was largely agricultural and thus emphasized the sun and the year, while the Mesopotamians were constantly under pressure from Semitic pastoral peoples to who the moon was more important than the sun. As a result, the length of the Semite year came to be only 354 days long, and the seasons, which require 365 and one-fourth days, to pass in review, moved slowly through the various months. To remedy this, a 19-year cycle was established in 747 BC by inserting seven months in every 19-year period, just as we insert a day in leap year. The older unreformed Babylonian calendar of 354 days was adopted by the Semites and came through the Phoenicians to the Greeks. This chaotic calendar continued to be used at Athens, although Democritus learned of the 19-year cycle on a visit to Babylon about 448 and Meton in 433, tried to introduce it but could not win Athenian approval. The 354-day calendar of Mesopotamia is known to the Arabs to this day. The attempt to fit the lunar month into the solar year was continued until the time of Julius Caesar, 45 BC. The Romans used a modified version of an Anatolian calendar, which they had obtained from the Etruscans, but they mismanaged it so completely that by the time of Caesar, the civic year was about three months ahead of the solar year. Caesar adopted the Egyptian calendar of 365 and one-fourth days by inserting two months before March and rearranging the number of days in the months as we have them today. This calendar was made even more accurate when Pope Gregory XIII provided in 1582 that full century years like 1800, 1900, 2000, and so on would not be leap years except when they could be divided by 400. The obsession of the archaic civilizations with astronomy and calendars had originally a rational and practical explanation, and undoubtedly it was pursued with this end in view in the period 5000 to 2500 BC. By the third millennium, however, both in Mesopotamia and in Egypt, the rate of expansion was beginning to slow down. The priestly or royal surpluses were increasingly being used for non-productive purposes and social discontents were rising. These priestly surpluses were controlled by such a small group that they could be applied to utilize new and better methods of production only by extending the benefits of such increased production to wider and wider circles of society. The priestly groups already had more of the necessities of life than they could possibly consume, but they were perhaps unconsciously reluctant to extend these benefits to such a wide group as to make their clique's existence meaningless or even impossible. Instead of using their surpluses for increased production, which would involve a drastic redistribution of the society's income, 
they began to apply this income to non-productive purposes. As a result, the age of expansion began to draw to its close about the middle of the third millennium BC. We have said that an age of expansion shows geographic extension of the area of the society's culture, increase in its population, increase in its economic production, growth of factual knowledge, and, probably, certain elements of science and of democracy. The existence of all these seems well established in the period of expansion of Mesopotamian society. Its area filled the Tigris-Euphrates Valley and pushed up into the surrounding highlands and across the Syrian saddle into the Levant and Anatolia. It even spread down the Persian Gulf to its lower shores. The growth of population is evident from the great number of tells across the plain and from the debris of thousands of residential houses in the ruined strata of these mounds. The rise in production and in standards of living is clearly established by the same evidence, while the growth of knowledge is recorded in the hundreds of thousands of inscribed clay tablets in these ruins. The advance of science has been mentioned already and is beyond doubt, but the existence of primitive democratic elements in Sumerian life must be based on inference. The arguments to support the existence of democratic influences in the prehistoric period have been given by Thorkild Jacobson of the University of Chicago. They have not won universal acceptance by other scholars because of differences of opinion on how much democracy is necessary to make a society democratic. There seems no doubt about the existence of democratic elements in the earlier period. The position held by at least some members of the ruling groups in Mesopotamia at the very end of the Age of Expansion can be seen in the famous Royal Graves at Ur, about 2500 BC. By that time, the people believed that their priestly ruler, called Insi, was the god's representative on earth, and that his intercession was necessary to obtain the god's support for all the orderly periodicities necessary to human life on earth. Since they believed in a life after death similar to the life on this earth, these priestly leaders were, in some cases, buried with food, furniture, treasures, and even servants to assist their life in the hereafter. At Ur, the tombs buried in the earth were full-size rooms constructed of brick and stone, the latter brought from the hills thirty miles distant. When the body of the Insi was placed in the tomb, his servants and wives were killed at his side. Several four-wheeled ox carts were driven in and the oxen and drivers killed and he was surrounded with rich furnishings. One Ensi's tomb contained the bodies of sixty persons killed with him. Another contained the remains of six men and sixty-eight women. In another, twenty-five persons were buried with the wife of the Ensi. Although many of these tombs have been plundered by grave robbers, we possess numerous magnificent objects that were left with the dead. Among these, were a 25-inch model ship made of silver, an elaborate headdress containing more than 25 feet of gold band, a helmet of sheet gold hammered to resemble locks of hair and even individual hairs, numerous cups, vases, and bowls of gold and silver, daggers of gold with lapis lazul handles, magnificently decorated harps, and many statues of animals in precious metals. The increased concentration of wealth, the increased diversion of this wealth from productive to unproductive purposes, and the great growth in superstition, magic, and irrational practices were soon followed in the late third millennium BC by a rapid increase in the frequency and intensity of imperialist war. All of these changes mark the shift from the age of expansion to an age of conflict. 4. The Age of Conflict We have defined the age of conflict as extending from the date when the rate of expansion begins to decline 
to the period when one political unit establishes a universal empire by conquering the entire area of the civilization. In the earlier part of this period, the whole core of the civilization may be conquered by one or more preliminary empires. In Mesopotamian society, we may fix the dates of the Age of Conflict from about 2700 BC to the Assyrian Conquest about 700 BC. The preliminary universal empires would be found in the Akkadian period about 2350 BC and again in the Babylonian period about 1700 BC. We have already listed the chief characteristics of an age of conflict to be 1. Decreasing rate of expansion 2. Imperialist wars 3. Class conflicts and 4. Irrationality These qualities were generally prevalent in the 2000 years that we have called Mesopotamia's Age of Conflict. Of these, the second is most obvious. By the latter half of the third millennium, war became the dominant activity of the society, and secular military leaders of the armies rose to a social position so high that they were able to dominate without ever completely replacing the religious leaders who had previously dominated the society. War became, in the minds of many people, the only way in which adequate supplies of slaves and metals could be obtained and by which some compensation could be obtained for the slowing up of economic and technical progress. The slowing up of such advance is clearly visible after 2500 BC, although the dissipation of the priestly surplus gave, for a while, a more equitable distribution of the social income and the appearance of a rise in standards of living. This slowing up can be seen by comparing the technical advances of the two millennia, 4700 to 2700, with those of the equally long period, 2700 to 700. In the earlier interval, we find dozens of significant inventions and discoveries. In the later one, we find, according to V. Gordon Child, only two. These two are positional notation of numbers in Babylon, about 2,000, and the invention of aqueducts by the Assyrians at the end of the 8th century BC. There were a few other minor advances, chiefly in military tactics and governmental administration, but progress in the old 19th century meaning of that abused word never again moved Mesopotamian civilization at such a high rate as it did around 3000 BC. Instead of progress, the whole period of 2000 years was filled with wars. In the first part of the period, during the third millennium, these wars were local struggles within the river valleys themselves. For the later and longer portion of the period, Covering most of the second and first millennia BC, these wars developed into violent struggles between civilizations. The chief aim of these later conflicts was to control the Syrian saddle, and thus to win, at one stroke, an important source of timber, control of the link between the eastern and western areas of civilization, and the right to impose tribute, in succession to the Maitani, on a major part of the commercial activities of the Near East. In these struggles, the chief contenders were the Egyptian Empire, the Hittite Empire in Anatolia, and whatever empire was dominant in Mesopotamia. We say whatever empire was dominant in Mesopotamia because there was a sequence of empires in the valley of the two rivers, roughly corresponding to the sequence of dynasties in Egypt. Ultimately, the Hittites and Egyptians who had been struggling violently for Syria in the 13th century, were both eclipsed, and the final victory in the whole Near East, including rule over all these areas, went to the universal empire of Mesopotamia. The Hittite civilization was ended by the Iron Age invaders of the 12th century BC, while Egypt, which had a shorter age of conquest but a much longer age of decay than Mesopotamia, suffered the consequence of this phasing by being conquered by Mesopotamian society. If we examine the history of Mesopotamia and Egypt from this point of view, we find an extraordinary parallel. 
This parallel was distorted by two relatively minor differences. Mesopotamia was older than Egypt and thus entered upon its age of conflict somewhat earlier, 2500 BC, as compared to 2200 BC. But being politically disunited and in an exposed geographic position, had a much longer age of conflict and a very much shorter age of decay. Egypt's protected geographic position, which allowed it to decay without much outside interference for a long time, fell to the Greeks without even a token resistance in 334 BC, while Mesopotamia, which had reached its age of universal empire so much later, had only a brief age of decay and accordingly still had sufficient vitality to put up a vigorous resistance to Alexander's invasion before it also succumbed in 333 BC. The parallelism of the two civilizations may be seen in the following table. Period 1. Mixture Egypt 5500 to 4000 In Mesopotamia 6000 to 5000 Period 2. Gestation Egypt 4000 to 3500 Mesopotamia 5000 to 4500 Period 3 Expansion Egypt 3500 to 2200 Mesopotamia 4500 to 2500 Period 4 Conflict Egypt 2200 to 1550 Mesopotamia 2500 to 750 Period 5 Universal Empire Egypt 1550 to 1100, Mesopotamia 750 to 450, Period 6, Decay, Egypt 1100 to 350, Mesopotamia 450 to 350, Period 7, Invasion, Egypt 350 to 300, Mesopotamia 350 to 300. In both societies, the age of conflict was punctuated by the intrusion of pastoral intruders, the Hyksos in Egypt and the Kassites in Mesopotamia, both shortly after 1700 BC. In Egypt, the Hyksos remained a people apart, with their center outside Egypt itself, at Avaris in Sinai, and occupying only a portion of the delta for exploitative purposes they were more easily expelled, about 1567, and Egypt resumed its autonomous evolution, achieving its full universal empire in what we call the New Kingdom, 1570 to 1166. In Mesopotamia, the process was more prolonged. The preliminary core empire of the Akkadians, 2250 to 2150, was overthrown to be followed by another Semitic intrusion the Amorites, and a second preliminary core empire of Semitic domination centered at Babylon. This latter state, whose best-known ruler was the famous Hammurabi, 1728 to 1686, was never firmly established, and the intrusion of the Kassites, a generation later, broke Mesopotamia up into conflicting political units once more. Only after centuries of interminable struggles did a real universal empire emerge under the Assyrians. Armed with iron weapons and employing a policy of ruthless militarism, peripheral Assyria emerged from the hill country north of the river valley in the 9th century BC under Tiglath-Pileser I, 1114 to 1076, and Ashur-Nasirpal II, 883 to 859, they conquered the area between Armenia, the Tigris, and Syria. The methods they used have been recorded by Asher Nasirpal himself in the following inscriptions. Quote, I stormed the mountain peaks and took them. In the midst of the mighty mountain I slaughtered them, and with their blood dyed the mountain red like wool. I carried off their spoil and their possessions. The heads of their warriors I cut off, and I formed them into a pillar over against their city. Their young men and maidens I burned in the fire. I flayed all the chief men who had revolted 
and I covered the pillar with their skins. Some I walled up within the pillar. Some I impaled upon the pillar on stakes. Many within the border of my own land I flayed, and I spread their skins upon the walls, and I cut off the limbs of the royal officers who had rebelled. Closed quote. With methods such as these, Assyria conquered most of the Near East and even conquered Egypt for a brief period, 668 to 652, but was replaced by Chaldea, a state of Aramean Semites, in 612 BC. Chaldea, in turn, yielded to the last Mesopotamian universal empire, Persia, in 538. The sequence of universal empires in Mesopotamia helped to keep the society stronger than it would otherwise have been. This is equivalent to saying that its period of decay was postponed. Each state yielded to its successor because its own instruments of governing had become institutionalized. But the arrival of new instruments of government at the succession of a new state in supreme control served to revitalize the society. This was especially true of the last of these universal empires, that of the Persians, which assumed control in 538 BC, and provided a very vigorous government for so late in the career of a civilization. By 350, of course, the stage of decay had been reached, but even then Mesopotamia, unlike Egypt, was not deep in decay as Egypt was. From these rather cursory remarks, it would seem that both Mesopotamia and Egyptian civilization followed the pattern of the seven stages of civilization with only minor distortions. The word minor can, however, hardly be applied to the next civilization we wish to examine, that of the Canaanites, 2200 BC to 100 BC. If you enjoyed this recording, you can find more and support the production of these works at my website, johnloth.wordpress.com. That's www.johnloth.wordpress.com. Thanks for having a look and a listen. Your friend, John Loth.